1993, university president Peter Demodopoulos was the keynote speaker. And after the event, he challenged Robert, who was that year's coordinator, to do more to memorialize the Holocaust. So that began a very important relationship between the community and Sonoma State. For a number of reasons, Sonoma State was an ideal place to house a permanent program about the Holocaust. Professor John Steiner, a Holocaust survivor and professor of sociology, had already begun to teach classes that dealt with issues related to the Holocaust. Other faculty, including Paul Benko, a Holocaust survivor who was a biology professor here, and George Jackson, a liberator who was in the psychology department, joined in quickly. And in the spring of 1983, Robert Harris began to recruit people to join in this effort to establish a permanent program. One of the first was Joel Newberg, who was working at the Holocaust Library and Research Center in San Francisco, which survivors had established in 1978. The center had sponsored some lectures, but they had nothing akin to a permanent program. Harris also invited Sylvia Sucher, a retired teacher who had recently moved to the area from New York. Sylvia remembered Robert Harris as an indefatigable leader with enormous determination who was able to work with all types of people. He was an inspiration. And Joel Newberg recalls, Robert was a one person organization. He knew what needed to be done. He knew how to interface with individuals and with groups, and he knew how to handle all the fundraising. He simply would ask and people would donate. The Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust was formed in 1983 on behalf of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and the desire to tell their stories. Those who began this collaborative effort between the community and members of the SSU faculty promised to let the world know of the atrocities that had occurred. As a result of these efforts, an initial program of six lectures a year grew into a highly successful lecture series that is now in its 40th year. Professor Steiner became the first director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, and Professor Myrna Goodman, then a returning student who was working towards her bachelor's degree, was the first student assistant hired by the center. Dr. Goodman would later guide the center for many years. The Alliance is a critical force supporting the success of the lecture series and work of the center. It conducts an extensive program of Holocaust and genocide education in schools around Sonoma and Marin counties, and through the center offers resources to secondary school teachers. The Alliance also collaborates with other community groups working on issues related to the Holocaust and genocide. After Robert's death, the Alliance decided to designate an annual lecture as a tribute to his dedication to Holocaust education. As we work to continue the excellence of this lecture series and foster an enhanced role for the Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide, we are always mindful of the critical role Robert Harris played in building this outstanding program and assuring that we would never forget. And so, in the 40th year of this lecture series, we are very happy and honored to have Elizabeth Rosner giving our Robert Harris Memorial Lecture. Elizabeth Rosner is a best-selling novelist, poet, and essayist living in Berkeley, California. Her outstanding work of nonfiction, Survivor Cafe, The Legacy of Trauma, and The Labyrinth of Memory was chosen as a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Interviews with Ms. Rosner have been featured on NPR's All Things Considered and in the New York Times. Several of her other works, including Electric City, Gravity, and The Speed of Light, have been awarded multiple prizes in both the US and Europe. Ms. Rosner's essays have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Huffington Post, and numerous anthologies. Having taught writing for over 30 years, she travels widely to lead intensive writing workshops and lectures on contemporary literature. We are very pleased to welcome Ms. Rosner to offer her insight on epigenetics and legacies of trauma and resilience, how the past lives inside the present. Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Diane. 
I'm, I'm so glad you outlined the history of this program. It was really important and meaningful for me to hear all of that. And I hope for everyone else too. It's, it's no small feat to have achieved a 40 year legacy like that. And I'm, I'm really privileged to get to speak to all of you today um, from my home in Berkeley. I wish we were together in person, but uh, this will do. I'm, I'm grateful that we get to do this. I, I wanna start by actually um, telling you a little story because six years ago when I was deciding on the title of my book, Survivor Cafe, I knew I wanted to call it Survivor Cafe, and I'll come back to that. But the subtitle was a little trickier to really finalize. And when I decided that I wanted to call it The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory, I was actually concerned about using the word trauma on the cover of the book. And um, if, you can, if you can think back as far as 2017, um, six years ago, which to some of us feels like a lifetime ago now, we were not where we are now or anywhere near where we are now in the sense that trauma was not a word on everyone's lips. And um, I think we've almost forgotten what it was like when, um, when we weren't all in a state of heightened awareness about traumatizing moments, traumatizing history, traumatizing on the individual level and the collective level, and yet here we are. So I could never have predicted that, um, that in the subsequent years after publishing this book, that these conversations about trauma and inherited trauma, which again, I'll come back to at great length, that these would become the conversations that we were having ongoingly, daily, some of us hourly. And just to add to that reflection, um, five years ago, so one year, approximately one year after the book um, came out, my father called me and um, my father, who um, those of you that have read my work and know my family history, my father was a teenaged prisoner in Buchenwald concentration camp. And much of the book Survivor Cafe narrates um, visits that I made with my father, starting as it happens in 1983, the year that Diane just mentioned as the year the center was established. And um, moving from 1983 to 1995 and 2015, not in chronological order, I talk about those trips in Survivor Cafe. So here we are now, it's, it's, um, it's 2018 and I'm being interviewed by National Public Radio as Diane mentioned, and my father calls and says to me, um, my endocrinologist heard you on the radio. <laughs> and that made my father very happy. I should think that, um, that his endocrinologist would hear his daughter on the radio. And there was a pause in the conversation. And then he said to me, I have a question. Do you think I was traumatized? And I, I tried to like hold my breath for a moment because my first response to that would have been to laugh at the absurdity of him asking that question. But, but I, I waited a beat and then I said to my father, um, well, I don't know, dad, what do you think? And he said, and I quote, I don't know, I never really thought about it. And so that contrast between the I never really thought about it coming from this person who had lived through a concentration camp as a teenager and all of these decades after, and not because he didn't talk about the experience, he did, not because he didn't think about the experience constantly, he did, not because I wasn't asking thousands of questions, I was, but because the, the idea of trauma, the idea of having been traumatized was not actually the way he held his own experience. And so I, I wanna say that at the very outset of this conversation with all of you, um, and I say conversation, not lecture, because I'm really hoping that we'll have, we'll have a, good, a good stretch of Q&A before I'm finished. Um, 
I think that we have forgotten that that the whole idea of trauma and traumatization and inherited trauma and collective trauma and historical trauma is still something relatively recent. So let me remind you um, that in the 1980s, the term PTSD, which again now has become so ubiquitous that we think it's just always been with us, but in the 1980s, post-traumatic stress was actually a very new concept and it was still being defined in a way that, that people weren't in full agreement on. There was a lot of skepticism about whether it even was a thing, if it really existed. And, you know, if you, if you rewind even further back to, um, to the wounds of war or the way that veterans of war were impacted by their experience in war, World War I produced a term shell shock. And shell shock was actually um, both naming the aftermath of war, but also in some ways diminishing it at the same time. It had a kind of dubious distinction. You know, did it mean that you were just extra sensitive to violence, extra sensitive to the sounds and impacts of war? Were you therefore somehow weaker than other soldiers or were you um, trying to get out of battle for some reason, trying to use the excuse of shell shock? And so again, we forget that, um, that atrocities haven't always been seen as traumatizing, even though for us now, I think, I think it feels so obvious and, and such a given that who would ever question that? So, I think the other thing that we forget when we talk about the word epigenetics, and I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what that word means. I'm going to I'm going to define it briefly as we understand it now. Um, relates to the idea that environmental impacts in events, either acute events like one time only or repetitive events of trauma, can actually change the expression of your DNA. And I'm very specific to say the expression of your DNA and not the actual DNA modified by these events. It's the way switches on your genes might be turned on or off. So for example, DNA related regions that focus on your response to stress, your adrenal system, whether you go into fight, flight, or freeze very quickly or very slowly, your cortisol levels, which are your, um, your stress hormones, those kinds of changes that get affected by the experience of trauma, it turns out do impact subsequent generations. And that has begun to be called epigenetic inheritance, namely the environmental changes to someone's expression of DNA that then get passed down multi-generationally. And even though that term goes back to the 40s when, um, when plant biologists, botanists were studying the effects on, on plants and subsequent generations, the more modern usage showed up because of experiments on mice. And again, I'm just gonna say this really briefly. Um, those of you that have read Survivor Cafe know that I recount more of the experiment in the book, but um, researchers at Emory University in Atlanta exposed a group of pre-adolescent mice to the smell of cherry blossom while they were being administered with an electric shock. And so that generation of mice very quickly associated that scent with something terrifying, something painful and something that they wish to avoid. And it turned out that three and four generations of mice later without the experience directly having happened to them, the first time they were exposed to the smell of cherry blossom, they panicked as if something terrible was about to happen or some pain was about to occur to them. And so the evidence seemed to indicate that they had inherited this fear of that scent, of that chemical odor. And what was happening at the same time as these experiments were that researchers and, and psychotherapists who were working with Holocaust survivor families started to notice that these PTSD responses that we now have come to understand as um, real, as, as behavioral 
specific behavioral attitudes and um, activities or issues mentally that these PTSD behaviors were showing up not only in Holocaust survivors themselves, but in subsequent generations. And so they started to connect those dots. So the question is then, you know, what does it mean to inherit someone else's trauma if you believe that that is possible? And I think, you know, again, I, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not here to defend the science of this. I'm here to tell you that as a daughter of survivors, regardless of the fact that, as in the story I just told you, regardless of the fact that my father never use the word trauma to describe his own experience. And even though he spoke about his experiences, he wasn't necessarily trying to transmit that trauma to me. The idea that we believe now through epigenetic inheritance is that I inherited my own stress level responses to my own environment, not because of what happened to me, but because of what happened to my parents and even my grandparents. And so when we, when we talk about inherited trauma now, what we really want to consider is how is it that the past, which is becoming more and more remote, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you that my father passed away last year at the age of 93. Um, after having lived a really long and, and productive and meaningful life, the question becomes, how does that history that I now carry and that gets transmitted further into subsequent generations, how do we hold that history in a way that continues to be meaningful? And by meaningful, I don't mean dwelling on suffering to the exclusion of all else or dwelling on damage and trying to make sure that everybody knows about the damage. My commitment, and again, those of you who know my work and, and have heard me speak before know that I'm as interested in the issue of resilience and responsibility as I am in the, in, in the definition of trauma and making sure that we all really understand individual and collective trauma. And I'm just as interested as, um, as many of you know, and as Diane and, and Stephen and I were just speaking about, I'm very interested in showing how those of us who feel personally connected to historical trauma actually feel a connection, an alliance, a, a, you know, a networked sense of familiarity with other genocides, other atrocities, and the descendants of those events as well. And I think what all of us now are trying to see and understand together is how does that shared legacy help us consider the future, help us consider not only how to prevent future atrocities or prevent any echo of those um, genocides ever to occur again. And unfortunately, as you all know, we've been failing really to prevent genocide in, in my lifetime and in yours. But the question of what, what leads to genocide, what are the underlying causes of genocide, those conversations are my and your and our responsibility. And the idea that each unique event, um, the Holocaust being incomparable in its own way, alongside the in incomparable legacy of trauma and inherited trauma and multi-generational aftermath of slavery in the United States and elsewhere, the inherited trauma of the Rwandan genocide, the inherited trauma of what's happening right now to refugees, migrants, um, the Rohingya, the Uyghur in China, I mean, all of these things that are currently underway are threaded through all of us collectively. And I think to make it even more relevant to this present moment, not because it's on a scale of genocide or atrocity, but because it does fall under the heading of shared trauma, historical trauma, collective trauma, what we're all experiencing 
in the last few years with the COVID pandemic is a kind of shared trauma. And I'm not gonna go into the details of why I believe that to be the case, but maybe in the Q&A we can talk about that. I just wanna remind people that it is on the one hand, a deeply individual experience. Those of you who um, may know somebody or several people who have died of COVID, those of you who may um, have been extremely ill when you got COVID, I'm assuming that almost everyone has had COVID by now, not everyone has, but most of us have. The experience of all the ways that our individual and collective lives have been dramatically transformed by events out of our control. And I think that's the parallel I want to draw here is the parallel of feeling victimized by events that you didn't cause and that in some ways have a beginning but not a clear ending. We're still at a place where we don't know how long COVID is going to be with us, is going to be dramatically impacting our lives, is going to be um, causing premature deaths, and, and we won't even get into the question of what long COVID is doing to us individually and collectively. But I think what we're, what we're faced with is this question of how do, we, how do we connect with each other around this shared experience? How do we honor the both singularity of each of our experiences one at a time, but also this recognition that these events cumulatively are changing the social fabric that we all live with. And so by extension, I want you to consider that those of you, of course, I'm speaking to a very select audience of people who have already been interested in the Holocaust and genocide studies, who have already committed yourselves to being knowledgeable and well-read and thoughtful about, about these issues. But even if you're not someone who knows a Holocaust survivor personally, or maybe has never even met or heard a Holocaust survivor speak, you are connected one degree, two degree, three degrees of separation from people who are family members like me, who are related to survivors. And I should mention, by the way, that my mother was also a survivor of the Holocaust. She was not in a concentration camp. She survived the Vilna ghetto with her parents and then was in hiding in the Polish countryside. And my parents met as refugees after the end of the war in Sweden. And were married in Israel and came to America. So I was actually born and raised in the United States. So you could argue that my life, you know, was in many ways protected, sheltered, privileged in contrast to what my parents went through. And yet I grew up in a community in upstate New York where all of my parents' friends were also Holocaust survivors. And it's not uncommon, as some of you probably already know, it's not uncommon for groups like that to find each other, to gravitate toward one another. And the same is true in other cultures and other, other places where survivors of one or another atrocity or genocide um, bond because of that shared experience. But the point I'm trying to make is that shared experience isn't just shared within that tribe or small community. That shared experience ripples out into the culture that we all share. And so what we're faced with right now is not just oh, those people are leaving us, they're dying, that generation is no longer here, so let's move on and talk about more contemporary atrocities. The, the point is really in honoring what they endured and what lessons are to be learned from what they lived through, we then have a special responsibility, I believe, to keep those conversations alive. As I said, not only to reiterate and, and repeat the traumatic stories themselves, but also to help illuminate where did their resilience come from? Where might our resilience come from? And that's why the idea of trauma giving way to resilience, it's not exactly resilience replacing trauma. In fact, it turns out 
that resilience is really a developmental response to trauma. And that resilience, ironically or not, only really gets um, embedded in us or amplified in us because of going through difficulty and challenge and, and something to kind of rise above or overcome. So research now that's trying to look into what helps build resilience, the paradox is resilience is built through hardship. And, and you know, again, it sounds like, oh, then we're trying to emphasize the role of, of suffering or we're trying to emphasize the idea that, um, that trauma needs to be talked about over and over again. In fact, there are many forms of trauma that people find unspeakable. And, and I want to say that when I was writing Survivor Cafe, I was trying to delve deeply into as many stories of atrocity and genocide as I could, I could locate in historical contexts outside of the kinds of stories I had grown up hearing all of my life, but also to kind of look for those patterns and to look for those interconnections and to try to understand more and more what I carried and what my generation was carrying and, and what, what that meant I was both burdened and privileged to do. And it turned out that at a certain point, I was so immersed in those traumatizing events, histories, narratives, personal stories, that I started to feel like language was failing me as a writer. And I had to respect the notion that, that in a way I was feeling a loss of, of my speech, a loss of my own vocabulary, and that words themselves really couldn't do justice to the scale and the, and the variety and the kind of epic nature of trauma over centuries, over lifetimes, over many, many generations throughout the globe. And so I, I try to address this question of what, is, what does it mean when we say something's unspeakable? And yet as a writer, it's my, it's my commitment, my obligation to try to find language even when that language feels um, elusive or inaccessible. And so I was about two thirds of the way through the writing of Survivor Cafe when I, when I sort of hit that wall and, and I wrote what became the first few pages of the book, The Alphabet of Inadequate Language, because I felt like I had to name what I was having trouble naming. And I think um, that idea about respectfully honoring victims of trauma who actually cannot speak about their experience is also part of our obligation as the students of history, as the students of the individual and the collective legacy of trauma is, is to allow those who cannot speak to be heard in their silence, to actually be honored in, in their incapacity to speak. And, and then to make sure that we really honor those who have made that sometimes excruciating effort to not just tell their story, but to tell it over and over again. So those of you that have been privileged to hear Holocaust survivors speak in person or to, um, read Holocaust testimonies, to hear genocide survivor testimonies from Cambodia, from Rwanda, from other parts of the world, from um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the victims of um, the terrible use of nuclear weapons to um, kill and wound and injure permanently, um, you know, a quarter of a million Japanese civilians. These narratives that are so excruciating to report and yet so necessary for us to listen to become even more important for us to preserve and, um, and respect because of the people who couldn't speak, because of the people 
who chose to remain silent or simply felt unable to speak because it would re-traumatize them too much to speak. Um, I want to um, go back to what I just mentioned a moment ago about um, Japan, because as I was searching for the language of survival and the language of traumatic legacies, I also was learning that in Japan, the word for the designated storyteller, Densha, isn't just referencing an inherited descendant of a trauma, as, as I myself am as a daughter of two survivors, but someone in the culture who actually chose to take on that role of being the storyteller, of memorizing in a way, um, sometimes verbatim memorization of a firsthand witness to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and therefore to preserve that storytelling in, in the way that honors the individual experience. And what I'm wanting all of you to think about today is what role you might consider playing as, as a story holder. Elie Wiesel famously said that when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. And Elie Wiesel is no longer with us. My father, both of my parents are gone now. Many of those who survived the Holocaust have passed away now. Unfortunately, as we've all noted, there are ongoing genocides and atrocities in our lifetimes. But what does it mean to be a witness as an inherited role, as, as a role of becoming a witness because you have witnessed someone else's testimony. And that's as a result of reading testimonies, as a result of watching videos or seeing somebody speak in person, and then asking yourself, what does it mean to, to remember, to hold memory past the generations that have left us? And I think that somebody like Brian Stevenson, for example, who many of you know from um, other contexts in addition to my book that I write about him in Survivor Cafe, he is um, the author of an extraordinary um, book called Just Mercy. He founded the Equal Justice Initiative. He also spearheaded the creation of an extraordinary museum in Montgomery, Alabama, to record the individual human costs of lynching and, and enslavement in the United States. And he also was inspired by the witnessing of Holocaust survivors. He himself was inspired to do this work of naming individual victims and teaching and educating all of us about the legacies of slavery and the way that systemic racism continues to plague us in the United States up until this very day is not simply to name the victims and, and try and then sort of move on to talk about the history as a whole, but to remind us of the individual cost of systemic racism and to, to trace both its roots, its sources backwards, and to show how it continues to impact all of us today, not just the victims and not just those who knew the victims or were related to the victims. So um, my profound respect for what he's doing, what Brian Stevenson is doing, meant that I was seeing those parallels, that his witnessing enabled me to also become a witness to that legacy. And that when we talk about genocides in a, in a kind of general way, we miss an opportunity both to see where the echoes are and see where the differences are. And I think that um, maybe in the Q&A, we can talk about that some more as well. Um, I, I have so many notes here to review, but what I really want to do is because I see something in the in the chat about q and I just want to check that um, for a second and, and I'll come back to it. But um, typically when I give these talks, 
I, I really love to take a lot of time for Q&A because I feel so strongly that this is a living conversation. And for that reason, as you can see, I'm not, I'm not reading a lecture, I'm not delivering a prepared set of statements, but I'm talking to you in this moment because I feel like these conversations have to always feel new. They're old and they're new. They're, they're conversations that we are having because of our lived experience historically, but also their conversations we are having collectively because we are sharing a present experience. And so that's why I started with the story about my father and his endocrinologist and the radio, you know, showing how those dots of connection ripple outward and inward on a daily basis. And the way that these conversations continue is a way of saying, I honor the stories that I heard and that I don't want to keep retelling them only in one way. I want to keep retelling those stories in ways that, that still feel alive. There's a very important um, line that I, that I like to quote that I unfortunately don't know who originally said it. I heard it from an epigenetic researcher. She was quoting a Holocaust survivor who said, I don't live in the past. The past lives in me. And what I love about that is that it reminds us that the past isn't something we are looking back to. The past is actually physically inside of us. That's what epigenetic inheritance is reminding us. It's physically in our bodies cellularly, but it's also a living thing that we are continuing to reshape. So I want to cite that same epigenetic researcher whose name is Dr. Rachel Yehuda, because she emphasized something really important about epigenetic inheritance. And that is, we sometimes fear that what that means is if we are ourselves traumatized and or have inherited trauma ancestrally, does that mean we are doomed to keep passing it forward? Does it, does it stay in our bodies and in our genetic code indefinitely? And the important thing that Dr. Yehuda emphasized is that she believes if we can demonstrate, and it seems there's plenty of evidence for this, if we can demonstrate that trauma changes us biologically, then we have to also accept that we can change again. And that's where the resilience comes in, that resilience in a way is defined by a kind of elasticity, a kind of, you know, you've heard, I'm sure the word neuroplasticity, which is literally the brain rewiring, finding new pathways. And that's for brain damage, like literally head injury or surgery or some kind of impact on the brain where the brain has to, a stroke where, where the brain has to reform new neural pathways. But it also can happen more sort of organically than that in the sense that we adapt a new set of behaviors. What's happening with PTSD, and one of, I think, the best definitions I've ever heard for PTSD is the inability to feel safe in a safe environment. The inability to feel safe in a safe environment. Somebody who's in a PTS, a, a post-traumatic stress response, is not using their cerebral cortex to process a moment. They're back in their amygdala, which is where the cortisol levels are firing, and those responses are the ones that say fight, flight, or freeze. That's all that part of the brain wants to do in a given moment. And what rewiring, what neuroplasticity, what these behavioral changes and modifications can allow us to do is rewrite that movement from the intellect back into the amygdala, bring it back into the thinking part of the brain and say, wait a second, I am in a safe environment. I'm having a reaction to this moment as if I'm in a, an unsafe environment, but where are my feet? And, and I'm not gonna get into treatment modalities because I'm not an expert on that. I just know there are a lot of treatments 
um, constantly evolving for this form of, of PTSD and, and other forms of inherited and, and personal experience of trauma. But the idea is that we can, we can work our way back from the amygdala into the thinking front, front brain. And so that change again means that we're not doomed to carry epigenetic inheritance. We can understand it, we can learn from it, and that the resilience comes from, in some ways, the naming of the trauma and then the renaming of the present moment. So when that survivor says, I don't live in the past, the past lives in me, it has a container. It isn't overwhelming and taking over all of her experience. It's that she's able to note that it's part of who she is, not all of who she is. And the word in Japanese for the people who survived the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is not the equivalent of the word survivor in English, but is a more nuanced word, I think, in Japanese, hibakusha, which translates roughly as bomb-affected person. And that's a reminder, I think, with language that we aren't only what has the worst things that have happened to us or to our ancestors, we can also define ourselves by, yes, that happened to me, but I exist in a way separate from that, or that's a part of who I am. It lives in me, but doesn't necessarily define everything about me. So for me, that returns me again to, to how language can help us frame and comprehend and, and recognize the subtleties of the way we carry trauma and the way trauma shapes us, but then we can reshape around that trauma um, and work our way through to the other side without totally letting it go, but recognizing that we can hold it more lightly or we can hold it in a way that, that isn't as damaging or as um, crippling for some people, as really paralyzing. So the, the image I wanna close with before we go into um, the Q&A, if you don't mind, is, is again to cite um, something from um, the Japanese legacy, which is, um, and, and if I were more technically skillful, I would, have a, I would have an image to put up on the screen right now. But um, some of you, I think, are already familiar with this visually. You might just not know the name for it. But I talk in, in Survivor Cafe about the Japanese art form of kintsugi. Um, and, and it's roughly translated as, um, the art of golden repair. And so if you can picture um, a ceramic vessel that's been broken and then mended with gold filling in the cracks between the pieces, I'm sure you've seen images of this. And, um, and if not, you can look it up after, after my talk. But Kintsugi and the art of golden repair for me is an image of the kind of healing and resilience response to trauma that I've, that I've been describing. It's a way of saying, we're not gonna pretend the vessel didn't break and we're not gonna hide the fact that these scars actually were formed by the breakage. And I mean that both on an individual level and again, as I've been saying, on a, on a collective social global level, these scars are part of our human inheritance collectively. But how do we allow those scars to be attended to with, with care and with the belief that this human experiment of ours is actually enabling us, I hope, I want to believe, enabling us to become better, more whole, more compassionate, more empathic with one another, to transform our breakage into something even, dare I say, beautiful, that our scars actually are part of who we are and can be, can be shown on the outside, can be seen as recreating a vessel that has been through something excruciating and yet is still um, whole again in a new way. And so I, I want to end with that image and that thought for now that, um, that storytelling for me and these kinds of conversations 
are a form of kintsugi. They are a form of using gold to fill in the cracks. And that, um, that someone like Brian Stevenson, others like him who are doing the incredibly important heavy lifting of historical memory on, on a you know, educational level, that the work of this beautiful alliance and, and center and the courses you're taking and, and the studies you're doing together are for me a form of collective resilience in the face of trauma. And I'm grateful that I got to speak to you today and I look forward to your, to your questions and comments. I'm gonna, um, I think, click on the Q and A um, box, unless um, unless Diane, were you or Stephen going to moderate a Q and A, or should I? I should typically I moderate it, but of course, we're always want to encourage people as we're asking these questions to please come in with some more. I'm sure Elizabeth, that was a very provocative and emotional discussion, and I'm sure you wakened a lot of questions about your topic. So, firstly. How is this multi-generational trauma identified in humans? How do researchers separate that from other instances of trauma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. It's a great question. And I think it's one of the reasons that, um, that some of the research in epigenetics in humans um, gets some pushback from people who are, who are skeptical about it because um, and this sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, mice reproduce very quickly. And so they can, they can test that generational theory in mice. Um, and it's, it's very measurable and very behaviorally obvious. It's, it's a simple, relatively simple experiment. In humans, it's much more nuanced. It's much more subtle. And I think, you know, one of the ways they measure, um, they measure these inherited behaviors in humans is through cortisol levels. There are ways that they um, they test a sweat on people's bodies. They test, you know, molecular levels of cortisol under seemingly calm, peaceful circumstances, and they note that these. For example, some people overproduce cortisol, and so they're constantly in a state of fight, flight, or freeze, regardless of their circumstances. There are others who are completely suppressed at the cortisol level, and they um, have no reaction. They're almost numb to anything alarming or, um, or fear-inducing that would be considered a kind of a natural response of fear. And so that's just one example, but, but cortisol is one of the things they look at most closely, the levels um, under calm conditions and under, say, alarming conditions. And so I can say from my own experience, just for example, I, um, I have never been tested, you know, in a lab or or in an experimental situation, but I, I, I do believe that I grew up with extremely high levels of fear and anxiety as a child that were kind of inexplicable given my given my safe environment of childhood in upstate New York in a very quiet little town, um, and I. Um, I believe that if I were if I were being um, tested now, if I if I were growing up now, I would be diagnosed with all kinds of things. But um, but I think that just to answer your question, I think that on the biological level, they're looking for those kinds of markers in 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 blood work at the cellular level and. Um, and yeah, your question about how does it get differentiated is, is the ongoing question. How can you tell that that trauma isn't environmentally induced rather than something that was inherited? And so again, because I'm not a biologist or a geneticist, I can only answer it in that rather general way, but I appreciate the question. Thank you. One of our other audience members says that being a son of a survivor, I always wondered about how much of his experience was passed on. I used to have dreams about the camps. Ask him if it sounded familiar, and many times it was. He rarely spoke about his experiences until I was a teenager. Yeah, I thank you for that. I, I do I do feel like there's a spectrum, and this gets back to what I was saying about um about these experiences of genocide and inherited trauma being 
singular and individual, even though we talk about them generally and collectively. And there were, as many of you know, there were Holocaust survivors who never spoke about their experiences. That level of unspeakability was, was extreme for them. There were other survivors at the other end of the spectrum who talked about it all the time. And so I think for, for generations like mine who grew up with survivor parents and grandparents, our, our experiences vary. Some of us heard it relentlessly and some of us never heard it. And so that was then leading researchers to try to understand how could people who never heard these stories feel the weight of them, feel and sense fear and have nightmares. You know, I mean, I've read a lot of accounts of, of children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who said they had nightmares that made them feel like they were themselves survivors. And um, despite hearing none of these stories from their family members. So I think that's also getting back to Antonio's question, but, but it's this question of, you know, how do you measure that? It's, it's, it's very subjective, right? It's not, it's not a test you can take with a, with a chemical, you know, compound. So um, I think that, you know, what I can say about myself is that as soon as I started reading about the research into epigenetic inheritance, I thought, oh, that's the name for the thing that I have felt my whole life. And I think if you ask, you know, generations of African Americans, generations of refugees from war torn countries, people who came over after the war in Vietnam ended, Cambodian refugees, refugees now, the, the universal agreement is that we are carrying more than just what happened to us personally. That, that we are carrying what happened to us ancestrally. And, and I believe that almost, you know, without needing the scientific proof, I feel like science is catching up late to something that, that in some ways we already have known intuitively for quite a long time. Quite a long time is right. What, what you describe often, it seems to me that not all of us, of course, are children of Holocaust survivors, but Many of us are children of World War II survivors, army survivors or conflict survivors or Vietnam survivors. Mm -hmm. And do you find that the level of trauma is as obvious in the children of those people as it is with Holocaust survivors? You know, again, not to not to try to map out comparisons exactly, but I because I often get asked, what about the inheritance of the perpetrator side of, yes. of genocide? You know, how is that understood and and um, dealt with? And it's extremely complicated to think that it's not just the victims who are inheriting um, these traumas it's it's the descendants of the perpetrators of, of these events too and so absolutely these are variations on a theme as is how i see it and i think that you know of course we might feel a more natural sense of empathy or compassion for somebody who inherited the victim side of of an event but i i have come to believe that the inheritors of, of perpetration suffer tremendously. I mean, you know, any reading you might do about what's what's gone on in Germany over the past, you know, almost 80 years now is um, you can't, I think you can't help but feel empathy for the people who were born after the war and what they carry of their of their national legacy, their family legacy and their national legacy. You know, shame, guilt, um, a feeling of responsibility for things that happened before they were born that they couldn't possibly have been held, you know, accountable for. And, and I think, you know, we have parallels of that here in this country as well. And I can say for myself that, um, you know, as, as a, a kid, I was a, I was a pacifist. I was, I, you know, I, even as an eight-year-old, I was aware that the, I, I, I was trying to understand why we were drafting people to fight this war in Vietnam. And, and when I found out that um, 
that 18 year olds in 1968 didn't have the right to vote, but they could be drafted and that and I would be watching with my parents these um, demonstrations on the news of, of these kids saying old enough to fight old enough to vote desperately demanding, you know, some kind of justice and, and also in protest against the war altogether. And I remember thinking, as a daughter of Holocaust survivors, my empathy level or my compassion was was even bigger around the soldiers that were that were you know being put in impossible conditions and circumstances of their own and so yeah i do feel that um that people who grew up with veteran fathers and sometimes mothers or, or extended family members have a lot of familiarity with this inherited trauma, this a lot, again, of the silence, the unspeakable parts, you know, the stories that never got told or the stories that were um, kept secret, let's say, but also this feeling of, um, of shame and guilt and, and um, and damage, you know, this awareness of of damage that, in some ways, seemed irreparable. And I think we're I think we're still living with a residue of that for sure in this country. Um, the residue of um, not just the war itself, but the aftermath, the aftermath of that war. So um, I don't. And and there's another question in the in the Q and A that that has to do with um, with left and right. I don't know if you want to. Do you want to read that one, Diane, or do you want me to? Right. I think I missed that one. Um, it's from Todd. Oh, oh, okay. I'll go back to Todd. Yes. Thank you for presenting at the lecture series. You describe your visit with your father to Buchenwald, noting that many socialists and communists were imprisoned there. What advice can you give to us in the post-McCarthy American society in which we are living Given the noble acts of many in the resistance, how can one get over the anti-left phobias we frequently encounter in the West? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that um, that nuanced um, comment. I remember in 1983 when my father and I um, went to visit Buchenwald for the first time. Germany was still a divided nation, and we had to go into East Germany to get access to Buchenwald, which was located outside of Weimar. And, um, and at the time, all of the historical references to World War II were fixated on the victory of communism over fascism. And Buchenwald itself had been um, one of the early camps established to um, imprison communists who were seen as you know, very threatening to the fascist Nazi government. And, and yet over time, what that turned into from my point of view was a kind of um, distortion of history in which the Jewish victimization had been erased basically at that time. And so um, the problem with the way communist governments and communist leadership um, have in a sense done some rewriting of history started to twist certainly for myself, my feeling of as, as a theory, I'm, I'm enamored of communist theory. Personally, I can say that. Um, but every communist experiment so far that we've witnessed um, has been extremely problematic. And so you look at Stalin, you look at Mao, you look at, you know, um, more modern examples like, like Putin. Um, what we're seeing is the way that communism is practiced as highly problematic, as, as you know, violent and genocidal and, and in its own right. And so I think the idea that um, left and right, you know, get used as shorthand for, I think, a lot of super complicated both history. And I know I've got a history professor on, on the panel here, so I don't wanna tread, you know, any more than very, very lightly into the realm of history here, but in that, in that sense, political history. But um, I think that we have to be really careful again, for me, about how we use language. And that even just saying the left and the right, for me, um, isn't quite as useful as talking about 
um, extremism, talking about democracy, talking about human rights, talking about justice, talking about historical accuracy. I, I think that, um, that those conversations need to be really nuanced and need to take into account you know, the ways that communist theory played out terrible, terrible, um, destructive decades of, of violence and murder. And, and we still to this day don't know how many victims there were of Stalin and or Mao. So um, I know that might not even be the question you were asking, Todd, but, but thank you for it. And there's one more below her, below. There's Marilyn also. Yes, I was going to, and I wanted to add something to that, but uh, Marilyn notes that the idea of reparations for descendants of enslaved people in America can be viewed as a golden repair. Did Jews regard the German government's efforts at reparations as a golden repair? That is a great question, both Marilyn's and yours, Diane. I think that, um, you know, in my own experience, I can speak for my family. So my mother um, applied for reparations when I was a child. I have a I have some memories of her filling out those applications and and going to these interviews that were that were actually re-traumatizing for her. And at the time, my father refused to do that himself because he felt in some ways it was, quote, blood money. And, and so I think that views toward reparations have changed somewhat over time. I think that, um, you know, it's a great connection that you're making, Marilyn, to talk about it as golden repair. I hadn't actually connected those dots and I like using that image for it because it is still very much naming the breakage, right? It's naming the scars. And I think the ongoing current conversations about reparations for, um, for African-Americans um, is so complicated because of how long ago and how infinitely vast the conversation needs to be. And so I think, um, I think what's so important about what the Germans did and what we are trying to look at in the German example is um, how do you overcome the resistance to the idea? Because early after the war, the Germans absolutely were not going for it, the public. And yet within a generation, they came around to, to um, collectively taking responsibility. We are so far from that in the United States. We are hundreds of years late in those reparations. So, and similarly with the incarcerated Japanese Americans during World War II and the internment camps and reparations for that. So I think it's a really beautiful notion that you're that you're connecting those dots. Thank you for that. And I and I think these are ongoing conversations that need to keep happening. Absolutely. Uh, Rachel has a number of questions here. Hmm. Does the age the parent experiences the trauma affect anything? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I don't know. Again, I can speak of my own experience. My parents were both um, teenagers. My mother was in the Vilna ghetto when she was um, nine to 11, and then in hiding 12 to 13. My father was, um, of course, not yet in the concentration camp, but still going through terrible war trauma prior to that in his early teens and in the camp from age 15 to 16. So. It was only recently that I actually realized, and, and you can say this is like, how could I have missed this? But that in some ways my parents are now being referred to as child survivors of the Holocaust. And I never thought about them that way. I, you know, I think because I always thought of them as adults, but um, but I wasn't even making that distinction. And I don't know, I don't know that those categories even were were really being delineated at the time. But I think that's a really interesting question to ask. You know, I, I used to think that in some ways my parents were more resilient than older adult survivors because they had less of a so-called normal life to have shattered and, and that um, 
that in some ways they were still in, you know, very adaptable youth mode and flexible youth mode. I think you can make the other argument in the opposite direction as well, that older people did better because they had the capacity to kind of figure things out and understand things intellectually or um, with the benefit of, of wisdom and experience. So I, I really don't know what, what researchers would have to say about that. I think it's a really good question though. Rachel also asks, does this uh, epigenetics effect work with positive as well as negative experiences? <clears throat> So um, again, great question and, and probably a little bit um, above my pay grade, maybe. I, I, what I can say is that um, some of you have, have heard the acronym ACES, A-C-E-S, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. There's now a scale that researchers use to measure um, traumatic experiences, the adverse childhood experiences on children as predictive of um, literal physical health issues they might encounter later in life, as well as mental health issues. And I and the reason I'm mentioning that is because that acronym has now shifted or evolved to be known as PACES, positive and adverse childhood experiences. So they're trying to also recognize that those positive experiences can sometimes counterbalance the effect of the adverse ones. And those are also predictive then. So resiliency can start to show up in children who've had incredibly challenging childhoods, a parent incarcerated, suicide in the family or other violence in the family, homelessness, addiction in the family. I mean, these are these are examples of those, of those items on the scale. And so the positive, the presence of an adult who is, is loving and listening to the child is, is considered a positive childhood experience. So, so I'm thinking that in the same way that these are being measured now as, as predictors or, or impacts on children's well-being as they age, it's possible that, that they're gonna you know, incorporate that into how we understand epigenetic inheritance as well. And maybe that's already happening. Uh, Ruth, first of all, thanks you very much for being with us and notes that today we are seeing a frightening resurgence of anti-Semitism around the world. How are you personally managing this in relation to your own resilience? Such a, you know, important question and and I, it's, it's hard for me to answer um, except to say that on any given day, I, I handle it differently, I think. Um, I, I feel a lot of despair sometimes. I think I began my talk by saying, or somewhere along the way I mentioned, you know, that in some ways all of this study of Holocaust and genocide history, how has it, how has it, failed? How have we failed to prevent atrocities in our lifetimes? Um, so there are times when I experience a kind of almost um, cognitive dissonance or dissonance or, you know, a kind of how can this really be happening now, given everything we know, given everything we've already witnessed, given everything, given everything we've already studied and, and, um, and tried so hard to understand and therefore prevent. So on a personal level, I think um, I try to remember that um, in the same way that I was just talking about the ACEs becoming the PACEs acronym, that I, that I try to remember that I also believe we are evolving as a species. <laughs> We're devolving. We're, you know, the worst of us is still bad and getting worse, and maybe the best of us is getting better. I, I, it's really, um, you know, daily and, and sometimes more than just one day at a time, one hour at a time, I think about how to, how to put my attention on, on hope, um, rather than despair. And, and I kind of, you know, makes me want to go back to the story I told about my father, um, saying, you know, I don't know if I was traumatized. I never really thought about it. I mean, my father was the master of denial. I got to say that's a classic case of, you know, both his incredible optimism. He was a tremendous optimist. And I'll tell you one more story 
from his point of view, which I which I hold in my heart often. And um, when I was 16, when I was the age he was when he was liberated from the camp, I I tried to write a paper about him for an English assignment, and I was interviewing him about his experiences. And I asked him, "How did you get through it? How did you how did you endure?" the concentration camp, how did you make it? And he said, um, he said, every day was so horrible that I had to believe the next day would be better. Mm. Wonderful. That was his answer to me. So I, you know, I, I, I hope I carry at least some of my father in me and that in a way is my answer, Ruth, to that painful question, but important. Karen points out that she thinks another factor that makes things challenging is pre-existing trauma that may have occurred before the Holocaust, mm -hmm. that that was her mother's experience. Have you had acquaintance with that sort of? Thing? Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. I think that's really, you know, we talked earlier about how do you separate, you know, inherited trauma from environmental trauma that you experience in your own lifetime. And I think similarly, with both of my parents, um, my father's parents were divorced when he was seven. His father left the country. His mother was left alone with three young children and, um, and the Nazis were already in power, but it, um, it wasn't yet war. It wasn't yet, you know, the Shoah as we came to know the Shoah, but it was already incredibly, you know, unsettling at the very least and, and really, very, very, very disorienting. And, um, and my mother, you know, experienced um, extreme loneliness. She was an only child. Her mother um, was away a lot. Her mother was was in medical school. It, you know, a lot of disruptions to their childhood happened prior to the war. And so I've always asked that question myself, how, how can you even you know, tease apart the Holocaust trauma from, from just early childhood trauma that they both experienced. And so, yeah, I think that, um, that they become layered on top of each other. And so, you know, that optimist part of me would say, well, all the more reason that they had to come up with resilience and, and develop skills to overcome all of that. But um, yeah, it's not evident that trauma began at a certain point and then stopped at another point, right? We don't, we don't really have precision about any of that. So I think that's a good point you're making. Uh, Todd makes another interesting point. He reminds us that in your book, you mentioned that Elie Wiesel lamented the production of the television drama Holocaust. Uh, what I'd add is that he also really didn't like any Holocaust movie mm -hmm. or representation of that sort because he mentions something like Life is Beautiful, which may, you know, may have had a great impact on a lot of people, and The Pianist, which I thought was a fine movie myself. But do you feel that it was a mistake to uh, engage in that kind of popularization of the Holocaust in the post-war era? Yeah, I, I do write about that in Survivor Cafe, and I continue to think about it and talk about it even now, because I think in this post-Holocaust era, and now we are in the post-survivor era, really almost entirely in another few years, there will be no living survivors here with us. Um, the, blurry, the blurry lines around accuracy for me are, are increasingly problematic. And, and the I would say the genre in literature and literary production of Holocaust-themed fiction is for me hugely problematic. I am very, very, very rigorous in my assessments of Holocaust literature when I feel that the writer is sensationalizing or, um, you know, exploiting really Holocaust testimony, survivor experiences, and and I think it's just going to continue to get more and more problematic. I I I don't think we're going to stop it. I don't think we're going to reverse that trend. Um, I think that um, it's up to us as readers and, and myself as a writer and, and a critic, but it's, it's up to us as readers to differentiate now between, you know, the authentic and the inauthentic and, and that's a big challenge. So, 
I know that Ellie Wiesel spoke very strongly about those issues and, and I, I too have become a voice for that. I'm actually gonna be having some public conversations on this very subject with some other writers in the near future um, because I believe that it really is a complicated cultural conversation, a cultural historical conversation to keep having. How do we retain our fidelity to history and our respect for, um, for truth and accuracy. But do you think that some of these movies like Sophie's Choice or some of the others that he mentions can also play a positive role in People to yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember when when the miniseries Holocaust was being shown. I actually was living in the Philippines at the time, but I asked my father what he thought of it um, when we talked on the phone, like once a month while I was living in the Philippines. And and he said he thought, and he was being interviewed, I think, for radio about it at the time. And he said he thought it was going to help educate people, you know. And so I think. That goal of education is key, right? That goal of awareness and education is where I, I think we all kind of share that goal. It's just the means toward that goal can be really, really tricky to navigate. And, and I quote Wiesel in Survivor Cafe when I said, um, a novel about Majdanek, which is one of the concentration camps, a novel about Majdanek is either not a novel or not about Majdanek. And I think it goes back to that question of unspeakability again, you know, yeah. that how even as survivors, how do you do justice to experiences that are beyond words? And so we are trying to create these representations so that people can get a sense of the truth, but you are distorting the truth while you're doing that. So it's complicated. Very. Uh, Christine asks, can you come? Comment on intergenerational trauma for Native American groups, knowing that so many Native American groups are extinct and their languages are lost. This is a really, really important conversation that I, again, feel so inadequate to do justice to. But I think the, the, the point you're making is so important because the language itself is one of the ways to have access to that authentic history. And so when the language is lost, the story gets lost too, and therefore the human experience disappears. And so I think the work being done to try to preserve language, to try to preserve the cultural legacies of almost extinct tribes and um, you know what the United States and Canada are both trying so belatedly to reckon with it's we are we are at the very very tip of you know an iceberg here and that's a horrible metaphor to use in this case it's just indigenous storytelling first people legacies um, are at risk of of vanishing completely from our awareness because of the linguistic loss as well. So yeah, I think that those intergenerational traumas um, have in many ways been ignored or, or erased and avoided. And I think, you know, I, I say in Survivor Cafe also that President Obama once said that, um, that Americans are, you know, really suffer from amnesia collectively, and that we're very, very good at pointing to other countries um, and asking them to own up to their historical atrocities, but we're not very good at doing it ourselves. So I think intergenerational trauma for indigenous peoples is a huge part of our legacy and needs to be addressed, absolutely. And I just wanna make a point about that too. Um, the light is hitting me in a different way right now. Sorry about that. Um, it's sunny, yay. <laughs> um, I, I want to say that as a first generation American, as someone who was born and raised in the United States, but born to parents who were obviously born and raised in Europe, I could easily, you know, absolve myself of all responsibility for any trauma, any impact of genocide and atrocity in this country, because it wasn't my ancestors who were the perpetrators. But I, I refuse to do that or say that because as a white person or as a Jewish person who passes as a white person, I benefit from the privileges that come to me 
you know, here now. And so I am responsible for the history of this country. And I am responsible for um, insisting that those legacies be addressed and that that trauma not be erased. And so I think that's what I mean when I say that we are collectively responsible for everything that happened before us and, and while we were here. Um, that it's not, it's not only limited to the group you belong to or, or the history you literally personally inherit in your family. That's a very interesting observation to apply to the German case as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much. I'm sorry that our time was short and it was, was a remarkable presentation for the Harris Memorial Lecture. Okay. I hope you come back soon. And now I'm going to ask you to visit with our Alliance members